Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Shane Lavelle. I'm from Bedeasy. Um, and this is a little story about where we were and where we were aiming to get to uh, with a little help from the enabler team. So just a little bit of an introduction about Bedeasy. Um, some of you might remember us. We were named Crown Bet this time last year. But um, now we are the third largest gaming, wagering and gaming operator in Australia. Um, we're part of the STARS group. They're an international wagering and gaming group that's based in Canada. Uh, they're the largest in the world. They also own a company in the UK called Sky Betting and Gaming. Um, our headquarters are here in Melbourne, and we have offices in Darwin and Sydney. Um, across the three offices, we have about 450 employees. We have a cloud-first business strategy, which means pretty much 99% of everything we do is in AWS, So, and it has been that way since we started. Um, thankfully, last year, we were the only major operator to survive the spring racing carnival without an outage. All of our competitors fell down on the big days and on the Saturdays beforehand. <laughs> Cheers. So where have we come from? So back when uh, BetEasy started out about five years ago, four or five years ago, there was quite a few number of regulations in the industry that prevented us from doing what we wanted to do. Uh, one of the first regulations was that uh, AWS could not run a wagering or gaming system um, directly from a company, so we had to purchase um, through a reseller. So that meant that all of our AWS accounts were set up through a reseller. Um, that has now changed, whereas now you can just go and get your own accounts even if you are a wagering company. Um, another regulation was that our databases had to be on premises and in Australia. So that restricted us as well. So our databases, which are pretty monolithic at the moment, um, they have all the business logic stored in them. Um, and we are breaking them out into lots of little microservices with RDS instances and all the fancy tools from AWS. But we still rely on a lot of the uh, core infrastructure that's based around those databases that are stuck on-prem. Um, when we set up our accounts, we had two accounts set up, a dev and a prod account. Prod account was okay because we are just running prod in there, but in dev, we had to run all of our business acceptance test environments, so which we had six of. They were small mini versions of prod. Uh, we ran a user acceptance test environment, uh, which is about a third the size of prod, and then we ran a full performance environment in production in, in dev, which was a copy of prod. So you're basically running about three to four times the size of your production environment in one other AWS account. I'm sure you all start to realize that you're going to start hitting a few problems with that. So the challenges we had were we had basically in each account we had a single VPC with minimal subnets. The blast radius for any team that was using those dev environments was quite significant. If one team spun up a faulty uh, EC2 instance and in an autoscaling group and it just kept killing itself and spinning up and spinning up, we'd eventually um, use up all the launch credits for the day. We'd also kill off our IP ranges regularly if uh, there was a faulty Lambda running and it just decided to scale up for no reason. Uh, it meant that our 14 delivery teams would be impacted by one team and end up not being able to do too much for the day. Um, service limits, of course, having a dev account with um, several hundred, close to a thousand uh, EC2 instances running in there, we hit service limits pretty much on a regular basis. Every two or three weeks, we're contacting AWS through the reseller to increase our service limits. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we contacted AWS again to increase our service limits for our NLBs, and we were um, told that we've already hit the hard limit. So tough luck, get rid of your NLBs and figure out another way to do it. So that's sort of a lot of the reasons why we've decided, okay, we need to scale out, figure out how we're gonna 
build all our workloads and move them into a scalable solution using many AWS accounts. Um, and finally, oh, sorry, um, when T2 instances came out a few years ago, everyone said, oh yeah, let's get all our instances changed over to T2s, we'll save so much money. Yeah, that's great. But if you're shutting down T2 instances every night and spinning them up in the morning, you'll burn, burn through your launch credits in about five minutes, and you won't be able to launch any more T2 instances for the rest of the day. So we hit that regularly. Um, another thing with having the reseller own our AWS accounts was that we couldn't engage AWS uh, for enterprise support because we were paying the reseller for the support already, and they had an enterprise agreement with AWS. So any time we wanted to contact AWS, it was through a middleman. So every time you raised a request, it went through a middleman, go to AWS. They'd then come back with the questions or queries that they had, come back to us, go through the middleman, go back again. This process tended to extend support queries to two to three days instead of one or two hours. So we decided to come up with this multi-account setup project. Um, first thing we did was we engaged the AWS architects to come along and tell us how we should set up our new set of accounts. We worked with our own architects and principal engineers to see what they wanted, what they were b wanted to build in the future, the sort of roadmaps they were thinking, what services they would need from AWS. So branching out from just the regular APIs on EC2s, what else did they want to look at using in the future? We also then were informed by AWS that there's lots of experienced partners out there. So we interviewed a few of them, sent out a few tenders, and Enabler got the job. So thank you guys for coming along and helping us set up our, our accounts. Um, they were pretty much one of the few teams that were able to provide us with the experience that we needed. We needed somebody that had gone through this two or three times before, and they were the guys that were able to do that for us. So next stage was implement. So the guys came in, we decided to automate as much as possible. So CloudFormation templates everywhere for everything. Nothing was going to be manual anywhere. If you need to push out any changes, it's through a CloudFormation template, and it went across all the accounts. We decided that in each account it would have its own VPC, but many subnets split across the different AZs and have subnets split into private, protected, and public. The security around the accounts would then be based on standardized roles that we could push out across the accounts. So it wasn't like our previous solution where we had many, many roles, many security groups in the hundreds and thousands, which restricted us a lot of the time when we started hitting limits and other security issues. Um, the rollout, which we're about to do, is um, the teams will own their own environments. So they'll have their dev, UAT, SVT, and prod environments. They'll own and manage their own infrastructure, and they'll figure out where they need to scale and where they don't need to scale. So it isn't relying on one or two teams to do all that for them. Everyone will manage their own destiny. The smaller blast radius as a result of having lots of different accounts means that each team will only impact themselves. They're not going to take down the account on anyone else. It'll just be their own account that they're going to effectively break for themselves. So other teams are now impacted and they continue working for the day. One of the tools that the enabler guys brought along was the Revolver bot. So the Revolver bot is basically a, um, a Lambda that runs on a regular schedule. I think it's nearly the whole time. And it will kill off instances that don't meet tags or don't meet security requirements. Or There's a lot of different configuration sets you can have with it, but they've built this awesome tool that basically says, if you don't meet what our requirements are, Say goodbye to your resources. Um, for the future, we should be able to easily add more accounts when we want them, instead of having to rely on a reseller. Um, we'll be able to scale our workloads as we need to. Um, we've been able to do that before, but it had to be um, architected in a way that we didn't sort of exceed limits. 
Um, we now have enterprise support direct with AWS, which means we have a TAM on a weekly basis. He comes in and advises us of new stuff that's coming along, where we need help, and yeah, anything else that uh, he can architect for us or bring in specialists to help us design. With that, I'm going to hand over to Mahesh. He's one of the engineers that worked with us um, from Enabler. And yeah, you'll hear his story of what they did. This is only part of what they did, but it's quite cool. Cheers. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, my name is Mahesh. Uh, I'm a senior engineer at Enabler. And today I'm going to share my wonderful experience in building this awesome tool, account vending machine. So about us, uh, we are a consulting firm based in Melbourne. Uh, we do uh, cloud automation, cloud compliance, cloud security, uh, and also we are an advanced partner with AWS and also with Google Cloud. Uh, we work on advanced DevOps technologies, including Kubernetes. You can follow us on LinkedIn and also on Twitter. These are the handles. So account vending machine. So before I start talking what account vending machine is, like why we need an account vending machine or why we need a multi-account setup. So the best practices from AWS recommends that we need to have your accounts based on your business units and further drill down your accounts to the multiple environments so that each team can have access to it and also have your core accounts like shared services to have your all shared components stored there and a separate logging account wherein uh, all the logs from your client accounts be stored there and have access to only the auditor or the security person so that no one can tamper your logs. So what benefits you get out of it is that you better management just like how Shane uh, said. Uh, the blast radius, again, with this, if something goes wrong in a particular account, is restricted to only your accounts and not to the entire AWS organization. And also the billing, you can easily track down what, what billing has been used with what account, so you can easily track it. Uh, but having said that, is it easy to build a multiple account setup without any automation? So imagine you have to create 20 accounts manually, log into the account, run your baseline services, but it's going to be difficult and always error prone. So based on our experience working on various clients, we took all our experience and built a final product. I cannot say it's a final, there is a further scope of improvement. We have a tool wherein you get a nice UI, throw in some data on the screen, press a button, boom, your account is ready. And launch a couple of more products using service catalog. You have your logging account with all your logging components installed in your accounts, as well as the same thing with the shared services. So it, it simplifies the account creation, follows the AWS best practices, as I mentioned, uh, ready to consumption of, of accounts. So once we have these accounts created, you can straight away start deploying your workloads and start using it because it has all the VPCs and subnets created. It makes the AWS uh, account as a commodity very cheap. You need not go to another, another third party or another team, anyone who has access to the root account or based on the service catalog uh, rules. Anyone can launch their product. Do a POC, if, the dev uh, if a dev team wants to do a POC on any of the new stuff coming from AWS, do a POC, launch the product, and once you are done, you can just terminate your accounts, which uninstalls all the components what you have installed, except VPC and other stuff. And it unblocks the dev teams and also brings culture changes. So anyone, just like a container, create an account, create it, boom, and then you bring it down. So this is how we started probably uh, two years ago. We used to create the accounts manually, log into the account. We had a set of CloudFormation template, run the CloudFormation into each account. So this was like a 50% kind of automation, wherein you still had to create the account by logging into the AWS organization, log into the account, and run your CloudFormation stack. <coughs> then we discovered something called a stack set. Uh, anyone use a stack set here? Yeah. So it's a pretty cool tool. Uh, it has its own limitation, but yeah. So you can have a stack set. You, have a, you can have a CloudFormation in a central account, like the logging account or the shared service account. You can run this stack set on a multiple accounts, like it's a push model. You run it, your CloudFormation templates get deployed into your client account, 
and then uh, you have all your services. It, it, uh, it gives you the same options like the create, update and terminate what uh, CloudFormation Stacks provides you as well as it also provides a good feature which we use a lot that's API. You can invoke it using any of the lambdas or any custom Python code. And then we implemented the same thing in our next step, a uh, different client. Uh, we had a Python code which used to invoke this stack set API. Uh, whenever you do a git commit, it used to, with a set of YAMLs. The YAML used to be like the account ID and the account email which you used to create an account. You push the code, this Python script would invoke the uh, stack set and your account could get provisioned. Uh, this gave us a bit of flexibility in terms of, uh, it, it provided a more automation, but again, the account creation and uh, the, they, they were a manual step involved and we chose to be run using a, it used to run on the command line. So that anything goes wrong, it used to hard bit trace. And then we finally, for the bet easy especially, we started looking at some console and then we came across this awesome tool called, uh, awesome service like service catalog. What service catalog basically does is, it renders the CloudFormation template into a console UI. And you can give permission to users based on their roles or based on their groups. It can, you can also, uh, just like how you use uh, create, update and terminate in CloudFormation, you can create a product, you can update a product and terminate a product. So it's a nice feature if anyone has not tried it to run your CloudFormation, you can use it. So that is what we are at today. We have a fully function bot running. So users have been, uh, the teams have been creating their accounts on the click of a button with a couple of input parameters. So it's a easy, it's a relatively easy to deploy tool. Uh, better user experience with service catalog. It's a console UI. It gives you it also parameter. Uh, and other thing is the cloud formation input parameter can be rendered into a text box and a drop down as well. Rich parameterization, robust and recoverable. So what service catalog does is when you click a button, it and behind the scenes it runs a cloud formation for you. So if something goes wrong in the cloud formation, you can easily revert it and get it fixed. Extensible caters for most of the requirements. If uh, uh, if AWS releases a new service and you want to deploy this new service across all the account what you have created before, so you can easily update your template and run uh, update product in service catalog. You can easily update your pro uh, account with the new services what has been included in your cloud formation. And anyone. With, uh, I mean, it, no, no one needs to be a AWS expert to use this. Anyone with limited knowledge can easily go and provision an account with set of input parameters. So these are the main components of AVM. First, you need to have uh, three core services create manually. When I say manually, is go to AWS uh, organization, create an account, note down the account IDs. And we, we have these accounts created. So shared services is a account where you store all your shared components. When I say shared components, it may be Active Directory domain controllers. We use Transit Gateway as a new service uh, for the networking. We have, the, we have uh, uh, Route 53 resolver rules, which is again a new services. So we store or we configure everything in the uh, shared services. In the logging account, we have only the buckets and uh, some guard duty master wherein is a central account which has access to only the security and audit team and all the, uh, all the logs from the client account would be pushed to this account. So once you have this, uh, the other stuff are the AWS step function. Why we use step function is that since we do uh, all, all our operation based on stack set API, we need to monitor the status of the stack set API. And we cannot keep waiting in the Lambda. So what we do is we do it in the step function rather than waiting in the Lambda, which would increase the cost of Lambda charge. And the important component is stack set. Yes, we use stack set uh, deployed in this core accounts and, and push this into the new account or the client accounts using the stack set. And Lambda, uh, we use Lambda heavily where there is no cloud formation support and as well as to invoke the APIs. And finally, the nice looking UI, the AWS service catalog deployed in the root account. And you might be imagining what is this cloud formation seed sitting in the center. So this is, also, this is one of the 
core heart um, heart uh, of this system what it basically does is you will have three git repositories one for core services one for root and one for logging account so how would you deploy all this stack set or lambda there so we, we use this in-house build tool built by Alex so what we do is we is use this cloud formation stack into that particular account and we run it we did just run make command it will upload upload all this uh, the below looking stuff into their respective accounts dynamically so there is no manual effort of creating a stack set or running your step functions there so i'll give you more details on the upcoming slides so a small intro on stack set as you can see it on the screen stack set is getting created in the administrator account then you can roll it out into the multiple account in multiple region it also has the same features as the cloud formation it's to create update and terminate and also it provides the api logging account this is how your logging account would look like the core account the central block is the logging account and the left block is your new account or a client account and the right account and the right side what you can see is the shared service again is a core account so <clears throat> the first thing is uh, it has a uh, buckets wherein it stores all the log per account basis for example a new account whatever is created have it will have its own bucket the cloud trail and the config bucket and all the uh, logs will be being pushed from your client account to this bucket and this bucket has uh, is connected to the sns topic as well when i put you uh, if there is any put object into this bucket it would trigger a, it, it would invoke a, it would trigger in turn it would invoke a sumo uh, event and sumo logic would be easily query the log so we have integrated the sumo logic as well and also we have partner with sumo logics so and we uh, we support you uh, people using sumo logic also we have tried this on uh, splunk as well which works fine and <coughs> this amazon inspector guard duty which gets installed as a part of your one click autom uh, sorry uh, when you do a launch product we also have a log destinations created in this logging account where in the logs the vpc flow logs from the client account as well as the proxy logs from the shared services would be coming in and stored there so this is like a central account to store all your logging related activities and this is how a shared service account looks like as i told you this is the account which makes all your client account usable so <coughs> it has a, it has a public uh, it has a vpc which has a public subnet wherein we run a proxy farm for all the egress traffic there is no none of the components would be directly connected to the internet and <coughs> we have a, a private subnet as well as a protected subnet wherein we run our core components like uh, active directory domain controllers uh, we have a ntp servers running there and also we have deployed the transit gateway to connect to the vpn back to the office and also the the important component is the stack set which has a set of configuration which should deploy into your new account and connect back to the shared services for the transit gateway and for the res resolver rules and all the uh, all the uh, domains from the client account would be connected to this shared uh, shared vpc to for the dns forwarding and it also has a proxy log group which sends the logs to the logging account and cloud formation seed uh, this will help you run your uh, cloud formation stack and lambda without any hassle so I think it's better to show you it on the Visual Studio how it looks like. Oops. So <coughs> you'll have this. Oh, sorry. So you'll have these three projects. And it contains the cloud formation, which you need to be deploying in those core accounts. So you have a cloud formation. We have a lambdas, which needs to get deployed in the shared services. So what you would do is, you would just run this make, which in turn runs the cloud formation seed behind the scenes, upload all the. Uh, 
upload all the cloud formation in the respective account as well as upload the respective stack set into this account as well as deploy the lambda into the account and it has a beautiful feature which i'll show you we can get rid of the uh, cloud formation output so if you are using a import in your cloud formation to get the value from the output of other cloud formation you need you can get rid of this so you, what you can do is you can do this stack output of this and you can pass it as a input to this so this is this is a yaml file which has a configuration which tells you what stack set to run and what values it has to be as well as you can pass the lambda code here using this a lambda zip functionalities as well as you can pass a s3 url and this is how you apply. so when i do a make command on this it would just uh, take this as an input and start deploying into the account which you are logged in through cli so these are the three uh, core accounts what we have let me get back and also while uploading it never uploads every time you run it uh, it does a checksum match as well if nothing is been changed in your cloud formation or in lambda it will not upload it to your bucket so what it does is it uploads to your bucket and start deploying it like lambda it deploys it the cloud formation it runs so it does a checksum match it removes the hard dependency as i told you the cloud formation output can be ignored authored by enablers alex bukara and it's open source as well if anyone want to use it for your daily activities it's not need not be for the avm if you want to run your cloud formation or deploy your lambda you can use this it's documented as well and this is how our service catalog looks like you have you will have three products uh, one click automation uh, one one click of account creation when you click it with the set of uh, dls and some other uh, uh, parameters it will create a account for you and creates a necessary iam stack so that logging components and shared services can go and deploy their components there and similarly we can uh, once that's done you can provision your logging components into that new account and once the uh, once that's done you can log into you can launch the shared service component which would deploy the shared services component into account so <laughs> service catalog, catalog is made up for people who have not used it it has two main uh, components that's portfolio so one portfolio can have uh, multiple products for example here we have one portfolio and that portfolio can be shared based on your users roles or group you can update a product you, as i told you you want to include something new in your cloud formation and roll it out to the entire account which has been previously created you can just update you can run the make command upload, upload update your template and come here and click the update uh, product it, it it supports a multiple versioning as well you can select the version whichever you want to deploy and update it it will automatically get updated into all your old accounts as well but provided you have to run it on the individual account not single time okay so <coughs> i spoke a lot on what it is and how it all let so let me just try to put i try to put it in a single graphical representation so that it would be easy for people to understand it's uh, so what you so any new user would have a root account first anyone gets subscribed to uh, aws they'll have a root account so next step what they need to do is create two two, two more accounts shared services logging account and then as as i showed you the three get repositories you have to log into each individual ac uh, account using aws cli you run the make command and these are the stuff that gets provisioned there if you have a service catalog it has sns it has a step function for invoking the lambdas once you are done with your root account you log into a shared service account sorry login account and run your make command so it deploys guard duty master kinesis stream for proxy and uh, vpc and the stack set which is going to be deployed into your new account so you store it there that's it next you log into the shared service component and here is a important component because we connect to the, we do the vpn connections we do the route table uh, transit gateway routing the active domain active directory domain controllers we run a proxy farm for egress traffic as well as for ntp servers and bastion host which is not yet implemented we are building it and 
the stack set which deploys the VPC into your client account and as well as the, does the routing to the VPN or the other client accounts in the organization. So once you are, this is one time setup, you do this, unless you have to update the template, you just do this once and you forget it. So next time any user wants to create it, they'll just log into the root account and click the service catalog. So once they do it, it triggers a SNS notification and then the, it invokes a step function and lambda and then your new account is created. A blank account is created with no services. And next step is to install a, a, a core uh, role that's AWS stack set admin uh, uh, execution role. We should trust all these three accounts so that these three accounts can start deploying their components into the new account. So once that's done, it invokes the stack set in the shared services and with provisions the IAM set for you. The IAM set would basically have uh, three SAML federated roles. So any users with that role can straight away jump in into the account. It also has a, a, a single sign on created. And as well as we do a EC2 default instance profile. So any EC2 instance attached to this role can directly uh, in the private subnet, the users can directly access this EC2 instance without a Bastion host by logging into the SSM manager. And next, it's time to configure the logging components. So you launch other product in the service catalog, which in turn would invoke the stack set in the logging account. And that first instance, it will create a bucket with that account ID, with that account ID uh, prefixed. The buckets are the config and the cloud trail. And then it starts creating all the necessary components into your new accounts and connect back to the bucket as uh, con buckets created in logging, as well as it, in, it directs your logs to the Sumo logic as well as a part of automation. And the next step is uh, from the service catalog, you launch a shared service component, which would provision a VPC into your new account. The, the, we, we, do, uh, we do configure nine subnet at the moment. There are three public, three protected, and three private. So, and it, it does a route table configuration as well, with the, both the subnet route table, as well as it assumes the role into the shared services and does a transit gateway route table configuration as well. If you want to redirect the traffic from the client account to the VPN, as well as to uh, divert the traffic from uh, this client account to the other client account. So we have used transit gateway here, as well as it configures the uh, uh, DNS forwarding uh, rules as well using the Route 53 resolver rules. So that's all in a single uh, presentation. So I don't think I have time for a demo, but I'll try to show how it looks like on the screen, on the console. Uh, this is my root account. This is my root account. And here you have the service catalog uh, installed. Uh, and this is created as a part of make command in your project. And next you have a shared service account. And if you see, it has a stack set being provisioned here. This is a stack set, which are going to be deployed into your client account. Which are going to be deployed. So it has a transit gateway routes, DNS set, IAM set. <coughs> Revolver is what Shane mentioned. It's a bot to terminate all your instances. It's again, a enabler build tool. It also, it has a stack set, VPC set. And it has, this is about shared services. Let's see the logging account. So logging account also has a stack set which is getting deployed into your client account. It has a bucket. So these are the buckets. So this, con this is a config bucket for the account 573 something. And there is a cloud trail bucket created for this account. And it has a AWS inspector and guard duty coming to the central account here. And also it has a config aggregator, which would report all your config uh, diversion. Uh, that's about it. I think um, I'm running out of time. So if I have any questions. Questions. Uh, it follows all the best practices as well as the security compliance, like. Do you have PCI, ISM, or uh, SOX compliance requirements? Uh, yep. Okay. 
And with Resolver, if I am not mistaken, that actually doesn't log internal requests. So if you're forwarding... You're talking about Resolver? Yeah, okay. now I'm talking about Resolver. Mm -hmm. It doesn't actually, because we have uh, ISM, uh, uh, ISM platform, and on that, the only reason we are not using Resolver is because we cannot capture those internal queries that happen from one instance to another. So if name resolution is happening within the bounds of a VPC, mm -hmm. Uh, Amazon doesn't have uh, Amazon doesn't provide auditing capability for that. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't. Log yeah, it, it will it will log everything that's going outbound, but within the bounds of VPC, if you have specified uh, resolver configuration, it doesn't log that. Because that was. Catch up during well, yeah. 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 Cool. So, why did you roll your own compliant continuous compliance worker when AWS Config exists? Is there some limitations of that that you? AWS, sorry, I didn't. Uh, AWS you. Config. Mm -hmm. Surely, the, I, I believe that that does that. You know, uh, instance remediation based on tagging and whatever you want mm -hmm. uh, configuration. Mm -hmm. um, you guys rolled your own. Yeah. What What was it that made you roll your own? Yes. Uh, config, I believe, it doesn't terminate your instances. No, it doesn't stop your instances. In the auto, in the auto. Uh, it. I'm sure it doesn't do the instances in the auto scaling group. Yes. Uh, Revolver does that. Sorry. Uh, no, no, is the, is the tool what does what we do is uh, there is something called a suspend processes in the auto scaling group. We remove that and uh, we, we pause it, and then uh, once once the time is like 7 a.m. startup, so it will uh, ch change the suspend processes from the auto scaling group and it automatically start start the instances. or stop at the night. And then we kept adding functionality into it. So we added these compliance requirements, tagging requirements and stuff like that, but it started as a scheduling facility. And after we had come up with Revolver, uh, AWS schedule became available, but it wasn't as attractive, so it, the, it was missing some functionality. And then uh, uh, AWS config remediation was out, but it was out only recently, so we hadn't adapted to using it yet, so we keep using Revolver for that purpose. Great. All right. Just up to the back of the movie back. Uh, thank you very much for the good, pre great presentation. Um, I can relate to it. Maybe in the break we can talk about it. Um, is this open source? You told Cloud Formation Seed is open source. Yes. What about this one? This is not yet open sourced, and I'll have to talk to other architects so that. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't. I can't comment on it. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. And another last question: uh, Can we get access to this presentation? Um, can we get present? Uh, yeah. Okay. Where, yeah. where can we get it? So the, it's being live streamed right now. The video is available on YouTube following the event. Hopefully, you guys are engaged okay sharing the slides. Yeah, we'll share the slides. Yep. Sure. No, 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 no. Anybody else? Any, 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 any more? All right, huge round of applause. Thank you very much.